Give us a little background. How did what led you to Leopold from the, your previous work? Yeah. So my first book is called Catlin's Lament. It was on George Catlin. Uh, he's credited with sort of pioneering the national park idea, and I looked at how those ideas affected Native American peoples who were living in the lands where he imagined the national park, and that intersection of environmental ethics and social justice really interested me in that in that work. And as a teacher. I've been teaching environmental ethics for years and requiring my students to write their own almanac. And, uh, and uh, my students actually inspired me to think about how Aldo Leopold maybe spoke to that intersection of environmental ethics and social justice. And I like it because it's sort of unexpected. We tend to not think of him as, as a social thinker. And I think in his time, he probably would not have characterized himself in that way. Uh, we think of him in terms of the wilderness idea. We think of him in terms of innovated on, innovating on forestry, sustainable agriculture. Uh, but when it comes to issues of the environment and poverty, issues of the environment and globalization, um, we tend to not attach his name to those issues. But I think that there are some things going on in this thought that speak to those struggles. So we're in the, again, in the kind of, you're midway through the basic research work that yeah. you're doing. So, in your, and we'll ask, you know, it would be fun to talk about this after you're done, but to, to describe now yeah. how you understand yourself, the intersection of the land ethic and environmental justice in yeah. basic terms. Well, I don't believe that from a historical perspective, um, it's accurate to characterize Leopold as a environmental justice thinker. But I think there are certain underlying principles in the land ethic that are, are vital to environmental justice thinking. And the first has to do with his concern for the spiritual danger. He said there are two great spiritual dangers to not owning a farm, right? First is the assumption that food comes from the grocer, the second that heat comes from the furnace. And so his main concern there is about how we're alienated from the sort of sources of our comforts and therefore distracted from the consequences of those comforts. And for Leopold, that's really a question of, it's really an existential question about what does it mean to be human? You know, if we no longer have any relationship to how we affect the world, are, are we any longer fully moral beings if we're not making full choices about what we're affecting, right? If our, our choices are coming from that place of alienation. And that becomes a very important question of environmental justice because just as Leopold was concerned about places that get seen as sort of a way, environmental justice movements are speaking from a way. The, the people and the places that are deemed our sacrifice zones, right? At the sort of bottom of the barrel of a global economy cheapest labor, the cheapest resources, the easiest not to think about mm -hmm. when it comes to where our waste goes and where our resources come from. That is the essence of the spiritual danger of environmental alienation that Leopold was so worried about. So even though he's not an environmental justice thinker, his questions um, are very, very important. And so, you know, you could argue that I'm sort of being very ahistorical here mm -hmm. in, in, in lifting certain concepts out of Leopold's time you could also argue I'm sort of anti-geographical, right, and lifting certain ideas of Leopold that came out of certain experiences in certain places and the study of land use in certain places in certain contexts and applying them around the world. Um, but I think if we actually free ourselves a little bit from what we expect to be Leopoldian landscapes, if we free ourselves a little bit from the Gila wilderness, we free ourselves a little bit from the shack or Tres Piedras, um, and think about the power of the spiritual danger, the power of land health, the power of ecological citizenship, the power of community over commodities, then suddenly Leopold takes on this new vitality. Well, I think there's been some understandable but unnecessary divisions within the environmental movement between, say, more environmental or social justice and more sort of wilderness or deep ecology perspectives. Uh, we saw it, you know, going all the way back to, you know, Cesar Chavez's struggles to ban DDT in the Sierra Club at first, kind of saying, that's not our focus, you know, all the way through, you know, Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman <laughs> going at each other, right? Um, all the way into the 21st century, you know, where you have examples of uh, anti-immigration groups, right, attempting to take over the Sierra Club board. And, 
And, and, and that division to me, I think, is being healed to some extent by the food movement and the climate movement, right? That, uh, you know, the sort of concept of climate refugees, as well as the concept of acceleration of species extinction, are bringing together, I think, some of these groups around discovering climate solutions and, and adapting to climate change. I think the food movement's brought together some in interest in both, right, the workers' rights in terms of our food system, but also the environmental consequences. But I think there's also some philosophical potential in looking to Leopold as offering principles that bring together uh, the best of intentions of, of, of both sides of that divide between the sort of wilderness side and the social justice side. And so that's my ultimate goal, um, is, is to, to show common uh, principles in Leopold. As we think about land, we need to think about livelihood. And not in the sense of where we get our paycheck, right? But in the sense of the ecological basis, not only of where our food and heat come from, to use his phrasing, but also in terms of our cultural identity. Um, Winona LaDuke, when I was racing with her, you know, it struck me that it, she's not Ojibwe if there's not wild rice in her stomach every fall, right? And for us in an urbanizing, globalizing world, right, a consumer society that's often alienated from the sources and comfort, so, sources and consequences of our, of our comforts, we don't know what our wild rice is, you know? Um, Sheila Watt Cloutier, who sued the U.S. government, she's an Inuit woman, right, whose people have been displaced because uh, of melting ice, right? And ice is the basis of their travel, right, the basis of their economy in many ways. Um, they're not Inuit without it. And what's our ice? You know, what's the basis of our livelihood in terms of how we get by, but also of who we are and livelihood as who we are as, as human beings, as Americans, as Coloradans. We're alienated from that. And so I think that there's a way in which these environmental justice leaders can instruct the land ethic rather than just adapt it. That if we think about the land ethic in the context of cultural livelihood, right, it raises the bar on what land needs to do for us and it raises the bar on what it means to be not alienated, what it means to be aware of the land, because it means being aware of the basis of who you are. And that's, I think, how you get a green fire, right, out of a community, um, is, is if the basis of their identity is disrupted, not just the basis of their survival. You know, when you think about the, what the Ojibwe have been through, right, and they still have wild rice, they still have, right, their use rights, to, to fishing, they still have their use rights to maple syruping. All the things that are almost prerequisites to being Ojibwe are rooted in the land and rooted in ancestors, and those are threatened by, um, by climate change, by acid rain, by uh, the wow. patenting of their rice. And it's a great challenge to the land ethic, to demand from the land ethic that it speak to our basis of who we are, you know? And, and I don't know what my wild rice is as someone who migrated from New Jersey to Colorado 20 years ago, right? I don't know what my ice is in the way the Inuit do. Um, but if we don't locate ourselves in that way, in a place, then the land ethic um, becomes intellectually interesting and historically antiquated, but not vital. And so livelihood, is the sort of challenge, I think, brought to the land ethic, even though I think it's already implied in the land ethic. We just need to shine a light on those aspects of his thought. We're talking, you know, decades before Silent Spring and the revolutionary environmental policies that followed it. I think Leopold put forth a very revolutionary challenge to our species that there's a way in which producing our livelihood can result in greater land health, rather than the answer being constantly shrinking ourselves. I don't think we've been able to wrap our brains around that. I think we know how to reduce the amount of waste going to a landfill. I think we know how to reduce our carbon footprint. But there's a kind of lack of imagination in that. And it doesn't inspire future generations, by the way. 
to think about just making yourself smaller. Well, Leopold put out this idea that, you know, we can be massive in certain ways. Well, well, well let's wish you luck, John. Uh, Thanks. You've been on a great journey, and I'm really looking forward to your further dispatches from the field. <laughs>